Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight after months of pressure. Ontario announces paid sick leave. This is a game changer and this will save lives. How it works, the criticism that it's not enough and what it means for other provinces facing the call to pony up. Also tonight. It was an extremely painful betrayal. His wife was assaulted by a fellow soldier. Then senior military members wrote her attacker character references for his trial. We're in a culture that allows people to tolerate sexual misconduct. A CBC News exclusive. Plus, question, scrutiny, held checks. What I'm experiencing here is nothing than racism. The experience of banking while black. And Haley Wickenheiser, Olympic champion, hockey coach, med student. Ready to go do rounds? Her message for the IOC is they push to hold this summer's Olympics. My job is to do what's right for the athletes. This is The National. Canada's third wave of COVID-19 is at a crossroad. For about a week, in a clear trend, the number of new daily cases has slowly declined, though not in every province. But at the same time, hospitals and ICU wards across this country grow steadily more crowded. Alberta surge so steep it's limiting many surgeries. In Ontario, hard-hit hospitals can now move recovering patients to long-term care homes even as a new report outlines continuing failures there. But today, after months of pressure, another step to help slow the spread. The province introduced three days of sick leave. Katie Nicholson shows us how far the long-awaited move goes and what it could mean for other provinces under pressure to provide a program. In the run of a shift, Brandon Deschamps comes into contact with hundreds of people. I'd be sick, I'd have to stay home, I'd have to, I wouldn't be getting any money coming in. There'd be some worry as to how I was gonna feed myself, uh, help out some of the people that I love. Today, that changed. Buckling under months of criticism, the Ford government introduced a paid sick leave plan that will run into September. Employers will be reimbursed for what they pay out up to $200 a day for three days. That's in addition to yesterday's pledge to top up the federal sick benefit by $500 a week. This is a game changer and this will save lives. That's up for debate, says this policy researcher. Three days is not nothing, um, but with 10 days required for self-isolation, um, back paid federal benefits that require a pretty heavy burden to actually access, uh, it's, it's not nothing, but it really is... Uh, it's a, it's a stopgap fix for now. Anyone sick longer than three days would need to use the federal sickness benefit. Critics say that benefit forces people to jump administrative hurdles, pays too little, and takes too long to kick in. It's one of the reasons provinces have felt the heat to come up with something better. BC's NDP Premier yesterday. We've gone back to the shelf and taken the programs that we were working on here in British Columbia, and we're trying to get those up to speed to fill the gaps at the federal level. Currently, only two other provinces have legislated sick days. PEI has three, Quebec two. Ontario's move might pressure others to follow suit and also introduce pressure to keep it going. I think it should be permanent. I think that, again, it comes to health and safety. You don't want to be spreading your germs. Keep them at home for as long as you can. But for now, three days paid sick leave will give some pandemic peace of mind. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Alberta reported 1,839 new cases today. It has led the country in new cases per capita for weeks now. And as always, sooner or later, some of those people who test positive take a turn for the worse. At first, COVID patients in Alberta's ICUs declined from record highs in the winter, but they started to rise again in mid-March, gradual at first, but over the past week, a sudden surge of 40%. Alberta's ICUs are now approaching those record highs again. Pressure is already forcing hospitals in parts of Alberta to delay 30% of surgeries in the coming weeks. And Aaron Collins explains doctors are preparing for much worse. 
Alberta's hospitals are filling up as ICU cases continue to stack up. Some surgeries now being delayed just to make space. And doctors say they're being prepped to make some impossible choices. If you're in a situation where you have five COVID patients uh, who need a respirator and there's only three respirators, how do you choose? That's what this triage protocol is set up to do. The Premier said weeks ago that this could happen. The government's own projections were for 20,000 active cases in Alberta, a number that's now been surpassed. There is pressure now, and that pressure will grow over the next two to three weeks based on the current number of active cases. We as Albertans need to pull together. Meanwhile, Albertans can still come together for a pint with friends, even as new COVID cases near record highs. Well, the government says it will consider some targeted restrictions in hotspots. So far, no sign that last call is approaching for patios in the province. There's, I think, a false idea out there that we can just, that, that quote-unquote lockdowns stop viral spread and that they can be effective in every instance. That's not the case. The Premier says the health care system can handle the coming strain, but some health care workers aren't so sure. There is a limited number of ventilators, beds and human resources to look after these people. You know, and if our third wave looks like Ontario's third wave, it's going to be really scary. You're not painting a very nice picture. I wish I could wave my magic wand and make it all better, but I haven't found it yet. About one in 10 COVID tests come back positive in Alberta these days. Some of those people will end up in crowded hospitals, ratcheting up the pressure here on the province's front line. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. In Ontario, hospitals can now alleviate crowding by moving some patients to long-term care homes, even without their consent, if necessary. This would be done in only the most urgent of situations, when a hospital is at risk of becoming overwhelmed. So this policy lands just as a damning new report lays out Ontario's failure to manage the deadly crisis in those long-term care homes. Ellen Morrow has details on how some of those failures still persist, as does the heartbreak of loved ones caring for vulnerable residents. I feel like I'm failing her. I feel like I'm failing her and I'm trying my best. I'm not a medical professional. But David Witta has had little choice no, but to you. become one. I got you. I'll always protect you, okay? Chronic short staffing and long-term care, he says, puts his mother, Thelma, at risk. I have to make sure that I'm there every single day for my mother at this point in time. Understaffing just one failure outlined in today's report. The pandemic's deadly toll in long-term care homes exacerbated, it says, by systemic shortcomings and deliberate decisions. We have a history of issues not being addressed in a timely way. Poor infection control and too many residents in a room allowed COVID to tear through homes, the report said. It also found the government of Premier Doug Ford, who once promised an iron ring around long-term care, was slow to act. And its pre-pandemic decision to stop proactive inspections of homes misguided. The responsibility to stand and defend and to change this system Absolutely. That rests with me. But Ontario's long-term care minister repeatedly deflected any blame. We didn't start the fire. While there have been decades of neglect, that response isn't good enough, says this advocate. There hasn't been really, you know, a lot of ability to the ministry to change the sector. Um, and that's going to go forward unless there's a really big change in, in the way that the government is dealing with this. The government has promised more hands-on care, but it balks at harsher penalties for homes breaking the rules. If the government refuses to fine failed nursing home operators, as the Auditor General suggested, then it'll be up to voters to hold this government accountable at the ballot box next June. Witta tries to hope, but has little faith left in the system. I need to see action. Um, that's the bottom line. Until then, he's taking action himself. Love you, Mom. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. The death of 13-year-old Emily Viegas last week from COVID-19 made headlines across Canada. And rising case counts among the youngest Canadians has parents obviously worried. But as Christine Birak shows us, while more kids might be getting sick in the third wave, they're not necessarily getting sicker. 
With the virus surging in several provinces, more children are becoming infected. It's just scary to see how many children are being affected by the variants. In Ontario, scientists say for the first time, five public health units found more than 10% of people tested had the virus. That's considered high. But in children aged 3 to 18, the numbers were even higher. There's a lot of COVID that's kind of lurking beneath the surface that we're not even aware of. During this pandemic, 955 Canadians under 19 have been hospitalized. Eight have died. But with variant cases rising in Nova Scotia, Sharon Beasley worries the virus might now be more dangerous for kids. I just feel like I'm in a bit of a void, that there's really no information. When we're seeing increased transmission in the community, we can expect to see more kids and youth with rare complications of COVID-19. But she adds the risk of death hasn't changed. A British study comparing the effect of the variant first identified in the UK with the original virus found no evidence of more severe disease in children. Very rarely um, children might get a little sicker and might require medical attention. And what I would say to parents is, there are three particular things I would look out for. If a child is having difficulty breathing, refusing to eat and drink, or being unusually lethargic or unresponsive, doctors say don't hesitate. Go to your local hospital. As for when kids might be able to get vaccinated... I expect um, it's going to be a little while before children make it onto the priority list because, quite frankly, they don't get as sick as adults do. Based on medical conditions, Alberta is offering vaccine shots to kids aged 12 to 15, but wider use will depend on Health Canada approvals. Scientists in Ontario say they can't see students going back to class in this school year, but they're hoping kids can be vaccinated by September. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. So let's pick up on some of that with Dr. Jacqueline Wong, an infectious diseases specialist at McMaster Children's Hospital. So Dr. Wong, as, as Christine mentioned, some kids between 12 and 15 with underlying health conditions could get the Pfizer in Alberta. What do we know about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines in kids? Yeah, so the information that we have right now is, is still kind of limited. It's still that press release from Pfizer at the end of March. And so far, the results are promising. Um, it looks like the immune response in, in children in that age group is comparable to adults they've studied. And from a safety and tolerability perspective, it looks good as well. Kind of similar mild symptoms like achiness, headache, you know, mild malaise, that kind of thing. And as long as they're unvaccinated and waiting their turn, what should kids and parents keep in mind in the meantime? Can they see their vaccinated family members, for example? Yeah, social interactions are so important and we just need to do it safely because there's um, variability in who's vaccinated and how many um, shots of the vaccine they've gotten. Uh, so with the good weather coming, thankfully, let's try to have as many of those interactions outdoors so that we can be spaced apart, so that we can get good ventilation. And if you're in a scenario where you can't keep that distance all the time, remembering to wear your mask, hand sanitizing, hand washing, kind of the same principles that we've known all along. Okay. Dr. Wong, thank you, as always. The pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me. Police in Ontario say two people are in life-threatening condition after a shooting east of Toronto this afternoon. It doesn't appear to be a random act. Uh, we know that there's approximately 40-plus shots fired at this point. A man and a woman were taken to a trauma centre in Toronto after a brazen daylight shooting involving two vehicles in Ajax. Police believe at least one person left the scene on foot. No one's been arrested. No suspect information has been released. Let's turn to a CBC News exclusive. A retired military couple is speaking out. They say they feel betrayed by the institution they served after senior leaders wrote letters to support a soldier convicted of sexual assault. Ashley Burke has their story. Is the village that we were in right before we got attacked? This is Kevin Shamoon in Afghanistan. He's witnessed the war, blood and misery of Kandahar, but says the most troubling betrayal came from his own chain of command on Canadian soil. It was an extremely painful betrayal. This offender violated my wife in my home and then was supported by senior levels of the chain of command. Kevin and Annalise Shamoon said they're sharing their story for the first time to drive change. Annalise had retired from the forces and was living in Kingston when a longtime friend and soldier sexually assaulted her twice. 
In 2013, I woke up one night and someone was in my bedroom. And it was someone that I knew that I had served with in the military. And um, he got into my bed and tried to have sex with me. At criminal court in 2017, a justice found the soldier guilty on all counts, but during sentencing said high-level military personnel provided character references that described him as a man of great character and leadership before being engulfed in PTSD, then gave the offender probation rather than jail time. There's a lot of soldiers who have gone through really horrible experiences and had PTSD and lost their marriages and they never used it as an excuse to sexually assault anybody. It's absurd. It's yeah. unbelievable. The Shamoons say they were blindsided to learn Kevin's regiment wrote a glowing character reference letter. For me, reading these words, it's beyond unacceptable. The author of one of the letters, Shamoon Superior, in his chain of command in the Special Forces, Major General Peter Daw. Shamoon said he confronted him over the phone. He expressed that he believed that the offender was a good guy and had been through enough. A year later, the convicted soldier was found guilty of sexual assault again in a separate unrelated trial, this time sentenced to three years in jail. Meanwhile, the military promoted Daw to a top job, commander of the Special Forces. I believe that through this experience, General Daw lost his moral authority to lead the Special Forces. So Ashley, what is the military saying in response to your story? Well, Adrian, in a statement to CBC News, Major General Dahl said that he never condoned these serious offenses and that he wrote the letter to provide the court with some context. But that said, I had a responsibility to recognize all persons who were impacted by the events leading to the conviction. And in supporting one, I lost sight of the complete needs of the victim and the victim's spouse, both of whom deserve my support. Ashley Burke, thank you for all your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. An Ottawa man is speaking out after experiencing what he says was repeated racist discrimination at a local bank. The bank has apologized, but as Nicole Williams shows us, he's far from alone in his experience. Keshna Spalding says every time he walks into a TD branch in Ottawa's East End, it's an uphill battle. Very, very, very frustrated. Sleepless nights, and I'm not candy coating it. He works in painting and construction and often gets paid with checks, which the bank insists on placing on hold regardless of the amount. He says tellers often ask pointed questions and calls the experience degrading. Ooh, yeah, it, it, is, it is tough because it brings me back to some ugly memories and what I'm experiencing here is nothing than racism. Spalding isn't alone. I absolutely hate going into banks. I get tense, I get a knot in my stomach. These Toronto area business owners have seen tellers cite bank policies to explain their actions like holding checks, even when those policies are discretionary. Make sure that my outcome and my experience is not a lottery draw. Experts say there needs to be a way to hold financial institutions accountable so that customers can deal with unfair treatment. Without any kind of scrutiny of acts of racism and discrimination that is happening in these banks, then people are left to their own devices. They can say, well, these are the policies that we've put in place. We're the ones who are uh, affected negatively by these policies, and that's why there needs to be systemic changes. TD has now apologized to Spalding after he recently filed a complaint. In a statement to CBC, the bank says, when an individual has the courage to speak out, we have a responsibility to listen and take appropriate action. As a first step, workers at the branch must complete training in conscious and unconscious bias. But Spalding says even after the apology, he's had a number of bad experiences. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Ottawa. The Canadian Grand Prix has been cancelled for the second year in a row. The Formula One race was scheduled for June 13th in Montreal, but will not go forward due to COVID-19 health measures in the city. Organizers, however, announced a contract to hold the race in Montreal has been extended until 2031, two years past the current agreement. And the pandemic is also throwing a wrench in Olympic prep. With the Tokyo Games mere months away, Swimming Canada announced today 
it's having to push back trials yet again. They had originally been planned for April, then to May. They now hope to host the event in mid-June, but they don't yet know where it will be held or even if it will be in Canada. Now, Japan is pushing ahead with the summer games, but only about 1% of its population is vaccinated, and COVID cases are on the rise there. Today, Olympic organizers unveiled the safety playbook for athletes. As Jamie Strachan shows us, it doesn't go far enough for some. In less than three months, thousands of athletes from more than 200 countries will arrive in Japan. We also want to make sure that the participants themselves are safe and, and they take uh, it upon themselves to guarantee their own safety as well as the safety of, of others. In new guidelines released today, the IOC says athletes will need two negative COVID tests 96 hours before arrival and will be tested daily during the games. A good start for some. And you will be more readily and more rapidly able to remove those individuals from other people. But some athlete advocacy groups say the IOC must do much more, like giving athletes their own rooms and providing better safety equipment. Athletes are not going to be provided medical grade masks when they attend, they have to bring their own. And I find that quite ironic, because if you go to an Olympic Games, there's condoms throughout all the village for the athlete's safety and, and safe sex. But yet when we have a pandemic, they don't provide masks for the athletes. The IOC won't mandate vaccinations for athletes, but Australia this week said they would give all their athletes the shot before going. Obviously a great relief for the athletes, uh, the coaches and all the support staff, and also for their families. We can talk about the morals and the ethics about vaccinating professional athletes for international competition, but there are vaccines and they do work and they would create a safer environment. Olympic officials in Canada say athletes here won't jump the queue. If vaccinations go as planned, most will have at least one shot before the games begin. Even beyond vaccines, advocates say more needs to be done. I would expect the Canadian Olympic Committee to come out strong and really demand more robust protocols to protect their athletes. The IOC will present its final set of rules in June, just weeks before the games are set to begin. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. The IOC is facing growing criticism around the Olympics. Among those with questions and concerns, Olympic champion Haley Wickenheiser. There's money, there's power, there's politics, and a lot of ego involved. The four-time gold medalist turned med student has seen COVID up close and is now expressing doubts about the Games. And as he approaches 100 days in office, Joe Biden makes his sales pitch to the American people. Tonight, I come to talk about crisis and opportunity. Plus. One BC woman opens Central Perk right on her front lawn. Welcome back. Tonight, for the first time, U.S. President Joe Biden laid out his agenda for America's future before Congress. And he started by pointing out a history-making moment. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President. No president has ever said those words from this podium. Tomorrow marks Biden's 100th day in office. So tonight is one part reflection and one part big plan for what comes next. Katie Simpson is at Capitol Hill tonight. So Katie, how did Biden make this pitch to Americans? Adrian, with President Biden now making the case that the pandemic is starting to subside in the United States, he's trying to argue that whichever country can rebuild its economy the fastest will dominate the next century economically. And he's shaping this as a race between the United States and its main adversary, China. And he's urging Congress to pass his big, bold pieces of legislation that will fundamentally change the way Americans interact with their government in order to be the fastest winner of that race. We can't be so busy competing with one another that we forget the competition that we have with the rest of the world to win the 21st century. To win that competition for the future, in my view, 
we also need to make a once-in-a-generation investment in our families and our children. Those investments look like universal child care, investments in education, as well as different kinds of social programs, very similar to ones in Canada and Europe, that expand the social safety net. And Joe Biden really tried to hammer how urgent this matter is, given the divisions that exist in the United States and what happened here at the Capitol back in January. They look at the images of the mob that assaulted the Capitol as proof that the sun is setting on American democracy. But they're wrong. You know it, I know it. But we have to prove them wrong. We have to prove democracy still works, that our government still works, and we can deliver for our people. And so the Republicans have responded. What was their take, Katie? They're not very, uh, not very favorable to these big, bold government programs. They're more for tax cuts as well as reducing the role of government in everyday American lives. Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina delivered the response and basically laid out that argument. Even more taxing, even more spending, to put Washington even more in the middle of your life, from the cradle to college. The beauty of the American dream is that families get to define it for themselves. Getting big, bold pieces of legislation through Congress will require Republican support. And Adrian, right now, it's not looking very good for Joe Biden. All right, Katie Simpson at Capitol Hill tonight. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. You are used to seeing Haley Wickenheiser in a Team Canada uniform. Well, now she's wearing scrubs. And my whole year in medicine um, has been consumed with a lot of anxiety. After being on the front line, she fears for athletes headed to the Olympics. I'm not sure if, if the games can be safely held at this point. Why she thinks the IOC is forging ahead. Next. Welcome back. As ICUs fill up in many parts of the country, health officials keep calling on everyone to help. Well, more help is indeed on the way. Hundreds of influencers are mobilizing to try to get Canadians vaccinated. It is a campaign called This Is Our Shot. And this Team Canada has a familiar captain. Oh, yeah, that one's okay. mine. Thanks very much. Okay. Leading the way again right. no. is Haley Wickenheiser. It is. Okay. Med student. Ready to go do rounds? Mom, development leader with the Toronto Maple Leafs, former winter and summer Olympian, and a woman who doesn't phone anything in. When the pandemic started, she launched a campaign called Conquer COVID, wrangling people like friend actor Ryan Reynolds. We need PPE, seriously. To help secure PPE for frontline workers. We're giving you Moderna, okay? Now a new campaign called This Is Our Shot. The majority of our immunizers are volunteers. Yeah. Encouraging Canadians to step up and get vaccinated. This is Moderna, okay. Yeah. To do away with hesitancy and pushing politicians to speed up distribution, to treat this as the emergency it is. <laughs> and you just finished nursing school. I did, yes. Far from not having time to do this, she'll tell you she doesn't have the time to not do it. It's a mini Olympic medal. <laughs> the clock is ticking and she's worried, not just for Canadians, but for the Olympic movement she loves, the one okay. supposed to yeah. bring the world right. together in just yeah. months. Hey, Haley, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Haley Wickenheiser and I took a moment to chat between her shifts at the hospital. So it's good you're wearing that because I was like, is it going to be your medical scrubs? Is it going to be your hockey jersey? Maybe an Olympic jersey? I don't know if you have a superhero cape in that closet behind you, but this is our shot. This is this is your new thing, right? Yeah, this is the the, the sort of the the new campaign on the on the twenty eighth that we uh, are going to kick off. So yeah, it's uh, I think we have over two hundred influencers now. So what are you going to be able to do? I can understand we need PPE, and then Haley goes into action mode, and and you rally people for PPE. But this is different. I think the whole aim of this is our shot is that. Here we are, 200 plus influencers from artists to athletes to you know, influencers in the uh, ethnic communities across this country, 
saying, you know, we're just average people like you and we believe in this, we got our shot, we encourage you to, as well as, hey, uh, the political machines out there, let's get going. And I think people are tired of listening to politicians. They're, you know, the message is drowned out. They're overall fatigued about COVID in, in general. Um, so it's it's just another way to maybe inspire and, and help, help everybody through it. Ultimately, um, I, I worry about, the, the health, the mental well-being, the health of, of our country in another pandemic after this one is over. It's it's just uh, as quickly as possible, in whatever way is possible, 24 hours a day if we need to. 5.09 a.m. <sighs> no stranger to the 24-hour grind. She's finishing med school this week. Ready to go do rounds? Over the last year, she's been in different cities across different specialties, concocting the kind of pandemic perspective only a med student might have. When you said that you were worried about a pandemic after the pandemic, what were you talking about? Uh, opioid crisis, uh, obesity, diabetes on the rise, mental health fallout from isolation and um, people losing everything in terms of their jobs and their livelihoods, families falling apart, domestic violence, um, all of the things that have come to light in, in the pandemic that uh, people have had to face and go through. I know you're not afraid of much. I've seen you in action, um, but I do wonder if you're a changed person a little bit, because I think the last year has taught all of us stuff about ourselves that maybe we didn't know before. You know, my whole year, I live right next door to my mom and dad, and my whole year in medicine um, has been consumed with a lot of anxiety of, you know, please don't bring something home and kill my parents. Uh, and so, you know, this is, uh, this has been on my mind. It's heavy. And, and a lot of people have felt like that. Did you develop any anxiety at all? No, I think I'm pretty well, uh, I'm pretty well able uh, because of my life as an athlete to cope with high, high stress, high anxiety and high pressure. And that's what's probably saved me um, through this whole thing. But just acute, um, acute awareness. My, my son has suffered uh, from a lot of anxiety this year. Um, imagine living with your mom who's trampsing all across the country in hospitals and, and coming home every day and not sure if you're gonna get COVID or not. And then he's worried about giving it to grandma and grandpa. And trampling all over the country, as she puts it, because of that whole other huge endeavor, the job developing players for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I go to the rink in the morning and two COVID tests later, if you're negative, you're into the bubble and, and on the ice with the, with the players of that day. And then uh, I managed it by usually working on my electives in emergency medicine by night. So that's kind of how I've been able to, to do both. And how do they treat you? Uh, Incredible. It's, uh, it's a great, uh, you know, I, I spent most of my life trying to, you know, make it and kind of be the girl in the male dominated world. And uh, I don't feel I don't feel like I have to do that here. Players today in the NHL, they, they just want to know, can you, can you make me better? Can you help me? And if you can, they, they don't care who you are, because that was one of the things that I love most about being an athlete was just trying to find that 1% every day to get better. And turns it over, Wickenheiser, breakaway, shoots, scores! Not since Sochi in 2014 has Haley Wickenheiser competed for Canada at an Olympics. She's not left the movement behind. An elected member of the IOC Athletes Commission, she was one of the first to openly call for the Olympics to be delayed last summer. Are, are you still at the table with the IOC? My uh, tenure ends in 2022 after the Beijing Olympics. Um, I don't know if I'm a black sheep in their family or not, but uh, I don't really care. I, my job is to do what's right for the athletes of the world. And to, you know, in this pandemic, it's been to advocate for the safety of athletes and for, for what's right. So um, don't get me wrong. I, I would love to see the games happen. It would be a great sort of message of hope for the world. But I think we have to always remember what we're in the middle of right now. I'm watching carefully with the numbers in Japan. I think 1.8% of the population only has been vaccinated. That worries me. Um, you know, we are not in control yet in this country. That worries me. There's other countries in the world not in control. I'm not sure if, if the games can be safely held at this point. And, you know, I think if our Canadian athletes go to the Olympics, they should be fully vaccinated and have had time to, uh, you know, sort of build antibodies and get their immunity up.
to go safely. It's the least that our country can do to send these athletes to the games if they're going to happen, and it's a few hundred vaccines. I, I suppose this is the IOC's decision, or is it Japan's decision? In the end, this probably will have to be a Japanese government decision, which will supersede anything the IOC wants to do. I think the IOC wants to go ahead with the games no matter what. And, you know, part of me wants to trust that that plan is a good one, but part of me has also seen what's happened since the start of the pandemic. And I question some of the motives. There's money, there's power, there's politics, and the Summer Olympics in, encompass all of those much more than the Winter Olympics do, um, and a lot of ego involved. And so we just better make sure that the decision in the end is the right one. Hi, guys. Hello. How's it going? Are you She'll keep pushing for accountability from the IOC. But her key focus right now, vaccinations, leveraging her influence here at home. This country's unofficial captain, Haley Wickenheiser, doing more than her part to keep her Canada safe. And so Haley Wickenheiser officially becomes Dr. Haley Wickenheiser in two days. She starts her residency on Canada Day. The Olympics are supposed to start a few weeks later. And what about the Special Olympics? It's been really hard during COVID. COVID may have canceled events, but the athletes are persevering. Next. Welcome back. The pandemic has put so many people's dreams on hold, including those of the Special Olympic athletes whose games have been cancelled until at least 2022. Tonight, we want to introduce you to some of the Canadian competitors to hear how they're coping and how they're planning for a big comeback. Hi, my name is Darby Taylor. I'm 26 years old and I'm a Special Olympics athlete. I play floor hockey, bocce ball and curling. My name is Rosemary Ding, and I'm 17. I play a badminton, swimming, basketball, yeah. My name is Alexander Conte Fowler. I am 59 years old. I am a special Olympian. I play soccer, basketball, floor hockey, snowshoeing, Back in field, softball, bocce ball. When COVID first canceled everything, I was very upset because it canceled all of my sports and my training. Almost. When everything canceled, uh, I feel nervous, shy like that. I feel bad why I can't compete with my friends, teammates, and training every day. What I miss the most is competing. I can tell she really misses it. She'll always talk about her best friend and yeah, all her photos she has in her room. I, I miss snowshoeing and being with uh, people like my friends, my teammates. Special Olympics has brought so much into Darby's life, into the whole family's life, really. Um, it's just made his life so full. You know, he's made and kept many friends. He's been able to stay active. I think the Special Olympics has taught her the importance of exercise and building good habits and setting goals. And it's given her, like, a new community to bond with. The Special Olympics has got Alexander out of his shell. He used to have really bad balance issues. His balance is better because he competes. He seems really happy and he likes to win. Special Olympics is awesome. They've done a lot. I'm very thankful for them. This past year, I've been going on my exercise bike, doing lots of workouts, and making sure that I'm eating healthier and drinking more water. At home, I did and go on treadmill, and sewing in the country because I. I make good people happy. I give them next a birthday present. I do online stuff with special outfits to keep in shape. It's real different, but it's better than nothing. I want people to know that we can 
compete just like typical athlete and also that it's been really hard during COVID and things too. That's the Olympics athlete, Spring King. Wow, you're dating, right? Sometimes she watches all these videos from past tournaments and events and she like shows me and our entire family and cheers. Look at you. Yeah, she really misses it. Yeah. When COVID done, I can't wait until completing again. I want people to know I never give up. I am confident in myself and I don't give up. Targeted vaccinations have brought relief to some hard hit places in BC. It's more positive kind of vibe that because so many people have had the have had the vaccination now. We'll take you there. Plus. Recreating an iconic show in the comfort of your own lawn? Stay with us. In BC, health officials have embraced the idea of vaccinating so-called hot spots. And the province is starting to see results, particularly amongst some of its most vulnerable residents. Briar Stewart has the good news story. In Prince Rupert, there's been a collective sigh of relief. Sure, a long stretch of sunny weather lightened the mood, but so did the plummeting number of COVID cases. It's more positive kind of vibe that because so many people have had the have had the vaccination now, you know, you feel a little bit, you know, like you're taking steps forward instead of backwards. Rob Gruber got his first dose of the vaccine last month, along with 85% of adults who live in this northern coastal city. Bit of a poke. Prince Rupert was the site of a mass vaccination clinic because it was a COVID hotspot. Cases began surging in February, topping more than 100 a week for most of March. But recently, there's been a dramatic decline. Officials say the high uptake of vaccines is partially responsible for the big drop, along with residents following health protocols. We're not letting up. We're not taking our foot off the gas pedal. We know that we're not going to reach maximum efficiency of the vaccine until after our second dose, after a couple of weeks. So we are still subject to all of the same provincial restrictions. Where do we stand? Targeting hotspots has been a big part of BC's vaccination strategy. Right now, there are clinics underway in Fraser Health for anyone over the age of 30. The fact that vaccines really look like it's really good at preventing infection means that we can use them to prevent transmission by vaccinating people with high contact and high risk. And that includes those on Vancouver's downtown east side. Cases were steady there throughout the fall. But after a vaccination drive that included teams going building to building, even setting up on street corners, about 10,000 got their shot. Two weeks following that intervention, we saw case rates plummet. And for the last five weeks, we've seen that plummeted rate sustain. Which is good news and reassuring for all communities as more and more people get vaccinated. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. A Vancouver resident has recreated an iconic television set on her lawn. Alley cats, alley cats, what are they for you? It has become a place for her to check in on her neighbors and make new friends, if you know what I mean. Next. stories you want. Completely free. The magic word. Let's go! No one told you that was gonna be this way. So, Rachel, Chandler, Ross, and Anne. This is Vancouver's Anne Bruin, and she has recreated the iconic Friends Cafe on her lawn. And she will always be there for you because Bruin says she created it for people in her area to connect during these difficult pandemic times. And she's our moment. 
Friends fan. I can watch Friends till the cows come home. I searched for a big coffee table with the right kind of legs and then my husband put on this border and then painted it green and, and he, he said do I have to put the angle irons on and I'm like yeah you do. <laughs> yep yeah you do. I just wanted to connect with people or give them something to look at when they're stuck and this traffic gets really backed up here. So just something to look at, snap you out of whatever funk you're in. Just a little tap on the shoulder like it's gonna be okay. I'm just going to sit here and whoever happens to stop by for a chat, I'm available. Like, if I see you wave at me, I will definitely wave back. And I know what you're thinking. How can people sit on that couch? She has measured it. It's far enough apart. It is safe. And she's waiting. It is a national for April 28th. Good night.